Welcome to Green Building Matters, the original and most popular podcast focused on the green building movement. Your host is Charlie Cicchetti, one of the most credentialed experts in the green building industry and one of the few to be honored as a lead fellow. Each week, Charlie welcomes a green building professional from around the globe to share their war stories, career advice, and unique insight into how sustainability is shaping the built environment. So settle in, grab a fresh cup of coffee, and get ready to find out why green building matters. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the next episode of the Green Building Matters podcast. Every week, I get to interview a green building professional somewhere in the world. And coming to us today from New York, I've got Joe McDonald here. I love his headline on LinkedIn. It says, Principal, Chief Energy and Sustainability Officer, Net Zero Carbon Strategist, Innovator, I just can't wait to unpack your story, Joe. Thanks for being on the podcast today. It's my pleasure, Charlie. And behind you on your LinkedIn, you've got the UN SDGs. Gosh, I hope we get to that too and talk about your firm and the amazing work that you're doing. So uh, take us back though. Uh, Where'd you grow up? Where'd you end up going to college? Oh, sure, sure. So I was born in Edmonton, Alberta. So I Midwest, Canadian Midwest. But I, at 13, I escaped, I escaped to Vancouver Island, where I went to boarding school, very British flavor, and got into, you know, rowing and rugby. Enjoyed that very much, athletics, and tried to keep my academics up as well at the same time. And then I got a rowing scholarship to University of Washington in Seattle. And so I rowed crew for those four years. I I was captain of the lightweight eight. Well, first, what a beautiful part of the country, the Pacific Northwest. I took my family there a couple of years ago, and I I really enjoyed that. Looks like you just went into the states there and and Washington State, too. So uh, now, did you know you wanted to be an architect when you grew up, so to speak? Or what guided you towards buildings, architecture, and all of that? I did. I did. Uh, Probably at at about six years old, I was already uh, making uh, architectural models at at my kitchen table. But then I at University of Washington, I did begin to study architecture. So I got a a BA uh, in architecture. And I think that what really did it for me was the University of Washington offered the equivalent of a semester in Rome. So you can imagine, you know, 17-year-old in uh, Rome for a semester. And I just fell in love with it. And even to this day, whenever I fly through the EU, I always fly through Rome uh, because it's uh, and stay a couple of days because of uh, have, have so many good memories of it. Oh, I love that. Uh, what what an early inspiration at that age too, and that architecture. Uh, so I love to also ask just sustainability. When did it first show up on the scene for you? Maybe not even say lead yet, but just sustainability. Oh, there we're gonna. There's a much longer story before the sustainability story comes in. Okay. So I left University of Washington and I went to London and I started my grad studies at the Architecture Association. And so I spent a year there under Zaha Hadid, who's a great influence in my career. And then I ended up coming back to the U.S. to finish up on the East Coast. I chose the design school at Harvard to finish up. And my first studio instructor there was Rem Koolhaas. So you got a, you got Zaha and Rem back to back. So that wow. was quite, quite the duo of influencers. Um, and I, you know, I enjoyed my time at the GSD. It's very competitive, which I'm no stranger to competition. And then a few short years later, they asked me back on faculty. So I joined the faculty at Harvard in 2000. Now, prior to diving into sustainability, one of my roles at Harvard was to choose it was in around the year 2000. That was when all the grad schools were choosing their rendering software. And I was coincidentally curating a show on uh, Ford Motor Company at the GSD. And so I had the opportunity to go out to Dearborn, Michigan, to the Advanced Design Lab. And I saw that they were working in an automotive aerospace software called Katia, which Mm -hmm. is produced by Dassault Systems out of Paris. Uh, And so I was fascinated by that software. 
And so the chair at the time was Toshiko Mori, who was a wonderful architect. She and I invited the president of Dassault Systems over to Harvard for lunch and asked him for 24 workstations. And so he agreed. Uh, And I I began teaching the advanced computational design uh, studios at Harvard. Uh, So our, my first love in architecture was computational design and the curving complex forms that were achievable by using this software. Uh, so Katia was also the inspiration for Frank Geary's digital project, which we began to use in the office. So I founded the firm in 2004 and I left Harvard in 2010. The office was in New York. And then after leaving the design school, I moved over to University of Pennsylvania. So this is where the sustainability story starts. We have never lost that computational look and feel to the to our work. But while on faculty at Penn, I began to really drive deep into not only sustainability, but also the drive to net zero. And so there, you know, there are a couple of YouTube videos out there where I'm trying to explain the difference between carbon neutrality and net zero. And it also was at the time when the financial world was also exploring these topics under the guise of ESG. So it began to drive everything that we did at the office. So our, I can very quickly tell you our core competencies all of which revolve around sustainability. So for example, we do design carbon neutral data centers. We design eco resorts. We are doing smart cities. I can tell you the current lists of projects in the office as well. And then we also do green roofs and plant walls, both indoor and outdoor. So those are our core competencies. In the office right now, we are building a 12,000 square foot passive house in Texas. We are designing a smart city outside of Medellin, Colombia. And we are designing an eco resort. It'll be the first net zero eco resort in the EU on the island of Mykonos in Greece. And we have designed a 2000 home development in upstate New York, which drives to net zero as well. So we're phase one of it is about 102 units. So it's not single family residences. It is medium density, two story clusters that we call them clusters. The idea is to move away from the suburban single family home and try to increase density, even though we're in upstate New York. First, Mm-hmm. Amazing projects and places that I've visited myself. Medellin, for example, the city of Eternal Spring down there. I've got some friends at Green Loop. They're doing some great work in the region and uh, just went to Athens, Greece for the first time. So, hey, you're, you're talking my language here. Uh, I, I love that you didn't mention just say a program like LEAD that I've made a career around. You've said frameworks. You've said just this is how we need to zoom out and do this work. That's what I've noticed here with your computational work. And I love two amazing schools that you've lectured at and and now your frameworks at your firm. So tell us a little more uh, about your company and, you know, just your team and where you're guiding things. Sure. It's it's actually, it's a very interesting story about how the team evolved from where we were to where we are now. We used to be on Hudson Street and we had an office space on Hudson Street. And at the time we were a a group of about 10, I would say. And so I had eight designers. Of course, we had one design director, but essentially all eight designers were I'm not going to use the word interchangeable because, you know, they're all wonderful people and they've all gone on to have wonderful careers. But they were, we had a very, and we still do have a very horizontal structure in the firm. You know, there is no superiority when it comes to design skills or titles or things like that. And that has served us very well. It makes everybody's voice feel heard which I think is really important in the office. Now, uh, pre-COVID, we were at 110 Wall Street. And then when COVID hit, 
of course, everybody went home. And what ha- what began to happen were was, you know, a lot of people decided, you know, well, I'm, I'm going to go back home. We're working remotely. And so we kind of had a a general disbanding of the team. Uh, and also, of course, uh, mor- there was a bit of a dip in morale. So between me and my chief strategy officer, we decided that we would, as everybody knows, uh, all students go to Arcanet for job postings. So what we did was we posted a job on uh, Arcanet. And we said that, you know, we are based in, we're looking for multiple computational designers. Our focus is on the drive to net zero. We're based in New York City, but you could be located anywhere in the world. And what that produced was probably about 300 applications in a week. But we did vet down to about 15, or we were currently sitting at 15. So I would say that we'll probably always be a boutique design firm. I like that number very much. But we're located all around the world. So, you know, the EU, Vienna, Athens, Singapore, India, Pakistan. And I was reading on LinkedIn one day, you know, how do you run efficiently a remote workforce? And one of the key points was that to have regular, you know, Zoom meetings when everybody could attend. So what we decided to do was operate on Eastern time, my time zone. And Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we have team meetings at 9.30 a.m. my time. So whatever time that may be for my staff, it's just a 30, 45 minute check-in as to where you're at. Then we all have on our laptops, desk, desktops, we have WhatsApp open, which means that we can have, we, you can drop a Zoom link in there if you need to have an immediate chat. You can drop design decks in there for redlining. It's it just, it actually, we work faster in using this model than we did in person. So. I didn't know we'd get pro tips on how to run a global firm. So that's a nice note, <laughs> Joe. I love it. Uh, uh, my sustainability consulting firm, we also went remote uh, all across the U.S., a couple of international employees and, and similar. I, I just love what I'm hearing here. Let's do uh, one more look back, though. Just what's on the highlight reel so far in, in your career or, or any other personal achievements, too? I always like to give that permission. What's on the highlight reel? Well, I think that what we're learning is that, you know, after 20 years of being in the business, we're now uh, designing projects where uh, we're able to raise capital because of our sustainability credentials. Uh, And so we're not taking on the architect developer role, but we are much more involved in the decision-making process when it comes to design. So we're raising capital to build our own design projects. I think that's a natural evolution for some firms. You know, when I think of many of my colleagues, they're doing similar things. So for example, the Mykonos Eco Resort, that will be run by Angelos out of Athens. And that is a property that he spotted. And it actually is one of the last approved plots of land on Mykonos. So that's kind of where we're headed. And the same is true for the project in upstate New York, where we found financing for that as well. So it, yeah, I think that the evolution of the green building movement Uh, is going to continue. I attend so many conferences and I speak at so many, so many of these engagements. So for example, last year in 2023, I was in Dubai three times. I was at COP28 because I'm a, a climate advocate. I was in Bangkok. I was in San Francisco. I was in Dallas. And I just got back from Zagreb, Croatia, giving a talk on the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, and four clean tech technologies that are driving the data center boom because of AI and ML and the internet. And so, for for example, talking about SMRs, small modular reactors, talking about hydro pump storage, 
talking about fuel cells, hydrogen fuel cells, and what are, uh, geothermal as well. So, so we're trying to stay on the cutting edge of these new technologies. We're, we are working with federal funding with the IRA, and it is available. So, that, you know, we are, we are trying to be as progressive as possible. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you really help put on that real estate hat, not just the design hat. You're trying to help get these deals done. And there is money out there for some of all this sustainability work. So I'm excited to hear that, not just here in the U.S., but you're finding money for the deals overseas, too. So I love that. And, and that's probably just a place you've had to evolve, right? Maybe that's just almost expected. Hey, let's let's get this deal done. We don't want to just do some mock-ups and renderings and it not get financed. Let's do our part to make sure this goes all the way through, right? That's what I'm hearing from you here. But you kind of hit on what's next. So I love to ask a green building professional like you, what else are you excited about that you're reading up on that maybe we should be reading up on too? Well, it's interesting because we are international and we build internationally. For example, we have a lot of experience building in Scandinavia. So If we were to compare the U.S. policies, now we're into policy talk when we come to climate change. So if we were to compare U.S. policy versus the EU policy, of course, the EU follows something called the EU directive, which is a much more progressive policy when it comes to scope three emissions, for example, or uh, carbon emissions. We follow the EU directive in the office on all our projects. So even if we're building in the US, for example, we're doing some some office to residential conversions in the financial district here in New York, local law 97, uh, which I also, I teach that at the building exchange. And, you know, that it, New York City has got some of the most stringent policies. And so, so we've, we're, you know, we're, Quite, you know, we're quite pleased with that. That's coming out out of the mayor's office. Mm-hmm. Uh, New Jersey is very progressive, and of course, California is very progressive as well. So, what am I saying? I'm saying that the future looks very bright from a policy point of view, and it's interesting. The majority of my staff are all millennials or Gen Zs, and so, so. Not only are they quick to pick up on these topics, but of course, they're, they absorb information so quickly uh, and then they deliver the goods so quickly. So, so um, I'm, I'm very proud of my team. Really embrace that technology. And you mentioned AI and machine learning. And you know, one thing I've noticed as a fellow entrepreneur and a business owner, is some people ask me in the United States, uh, depending on who's the president, does it shift? a lot of our sustainability work. And and I argue, well, you know, for Republicans in office, it's pro-business, you know, better tax setup that helps business owners. But over here, of Democrats in office, sure, we've got some great policy, the IRA, like you said. But set that aside, there's so many state mandates, like you mentioned, city mandates. Mm -hmm. And don't forget corporate mandates, right, who are really driving this, if it's in their corporate sustainability policy. So I would argue, hey, so much is baked in as maybe administration shift, we still have a lot of good mandates that are going to keep this work going. Would, would you agree with most of that? I absolutely would agree. I, when we look at the at some of the top developers around the country, Heinz is a great example. Their policies are, well, Heinz is a global real estate developer, but their policies um, are very progressive. And, they, you know, so so they're leading the way. So, so you know, I could list a, a, a dozen Brookfield properties, uh, Silverstein, you know, these are organizations that take this topic of building green really seriously. And they're doing a, they're doing a great job. And they're also... <laughs> Remember, they're also pumping their own capital into these projects, which they didn't necessarily have to. They didn't necessarily have to do so. So I really admire them. Well said. Let's do some rapid fire questions. I'm loving our conversation here, Joe. Let's get to know you a little better. What would you say is your specialty or gift? (laughs) Great question. Patience, creativity, curiosity, and grit, I would say. I love that. You need a lot of that as an entrepreneur, too. So patience, though, let's unpack it one more. Do you really think before you speak? Do you count? Just 
How have you built that muscle over the years? That's a great question. Just uh, hit pause when you're on a Zoom call. There's a great saying that I will share with you. Does it need to be said? Does it need to be said by me? Does it need to be said by me now? <laughs> and so that, that, those are words I live by. <laughs> oh, beautiful. A lot of wisdom there. I love that. Next, I like to ask my podcast guests about either good habits or routines or rituals. What helps you stay on point, Joe? Yeah, I, I would say morning meditations. You know, I've, I've got a great dog, Levi. He's a boxer. So he, you know, he and I, we have our morning evening walks. I uh, try to work out every evening because the, the majority of my staff by, you know, four or five p.m. my time, that's their day is over. So I try to allow, you know, an hour or so for myself for, you know, hitting the gym. I think physical activity is really important. So important. How about a bucket list? As you and I get to know each other a little better, I'm a fan of a bucket list. Not everybody has one, but is there any adventure or travel or do you want to write a book? What's on the bucket list? Yeah, you know, I I, I am a bucket list fan uh, like you. Um, and it, it is travel. Um, I've been fortunate enough uh, both uh, in business and in leisure to have traveled to many places. Uh, the one place I have not traveled to uh, is Patagonia, uh, mm. which would be on my bucket list. Yeah. Oh, man, love it. You know, as we think about books, um, it doesn't have to be about buildings, but is there a book you'd recommend even when you go back to it's interesting. Another side, another per personal side of mine is uh, I'm a contemporary art collector. So there's a particular sliver of time that I'm really interested in. And this, when I did the Ford Motor exhibit at GSD, it's the sliver of time between 1968 and 1972, which was a really great era for a lot of things, for film, you know, for fashion, for cars, you know, it was just a, a, a great sliver of time. And so I collect a lot of first edition artwork from that period of time. So, so is there a book? Yes, there's a book called 60s Unplugged that I find it reminds me and takes me back and educates me on that period of time. If you're looking for a book on climate change or sustainability, I probably, there, there are so many sitting on my desk right now that I would be hard pressed to say. Well, we'll put a link to the book there, 60s Unplug, for sure, in our podcast show notes. And just a couple more questions as we start to wind down. Uh, Joe, just as you look back on your career, is there any career advice you wish you'd have heard earlier? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that when I graduated from grad school, I wish that I, you know, of course, I had mentors throughout my education, but I wish I was, I had the self awareness and the confidence to know that uh, pursuing a passion was intuitively the right thing to do. And so that passion would have been, you know, private practice, or at least what I actually did do was, uh, while on faculty, um, you know, a few years later, I began to build a series of clientless projects. So we did a lot of product design, you know, tables, benches. We did a, we did a, a giant light fixture for Audi out in uh, Santa Monica. So they were really exploratory forms that had function. And it's very interesting. Those projects got published and people saw those projects and that launched my career. So for example, I think one of the most popular projects of urban a and that people may know of is the Water Planet in California Academy of Sciences by Renzo Piano. It's on the lower level. It's a children's aquarium. The Think Design was the overall designer of the Steinhardt Aquarium, which included the Water Planet. They saw that work, I believe it was in, in interior design, and they invited me up to speak, and it turned out to be a, a great co collaboration, and it mm. kicked off Urban a and Man, I, I'm hearing put yourself out there, put your work out there, even when it comes to that kind of design, and who knows what doors it will open for you. So uh, last question, Joe. Gosh, what a fascinating conversation. Say someone listening is just now 
jumping into the green building movement, a movement that's been good to you. It's been good to me. Maybe they're a young professional. Maybe they're making a career change. But do you have any words of encouragement if they're just now jumping into the green building movement? Yeah, there's. it's never too late to jump into this. So let's say that you're you just you're an undergrad, you just finished school. Do you need more education? Think hard about that. Maybe what you need is a little bit of experience, right? Like test the waters before you sign up for that for that you know that that grad that graduate degree. Uh, and then also even mid career uh, folks who are fascinated by the green building movement, you know, align yourself with organizations. And there are many, all you have to do is be active on LinkedIn and you will find many newsletters, many green job postings, just simply get involved. And I've seen many colleagues, both, uh, you know, both young people uh, and also mid-career people um, make this switch. uh, And they're so thrilled that they did uh, because the net of making that switch is you do end up making an impact uh, into this space. So I encourage everybody who's interested, you know, to really take a crack at it. Amazing words of encouragement. I think everyone's going to be inspired by your story. When everybody listens to this, listen to it twice. It was that good today, Joe. Thank you so much for being on the Green Building Matters podcast. I truly appreciate it. I appreciate it too, Charlie. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Green Building Matters podcast. At GBES.com, our mission is to advance the green building movement through best-in-class education and encouragement. Remember, you can go to GBES.com slash podcast for any notes and links that we mentioned in today's episode. And you can actually see the other episodes that have already been recorded with our amazing guests. Please tell your friends about this podcast. Tell your colleagues. And if you really enjoyed it, leave a positive review on iTunes. Thank you so much, and we'll see you on next week's episode.